Yeah, so I work at a company called Platinum 45. We're a Ruby on Rails dev shop in Cape Town and Joburg. So today uh, I'm going to be talking about something. Uh, so we've just had a talk about the fastest way to run Ruby. I'm going to talk about the slowest way to run Ruby. Uh, yeah, so how'd you, how'd you like Ruby? So I wrote Ruby in Ruby, so you can run Ruby while you run Ruby. But I thought this meme format's a bit out of date, so I thought I'd up to update it a bit. I used the Ruby to create the Ruby. So the first question you might be wondering is, why? Why? Why the hell? Um, so last year, if, you, if any of you were here, you would have remembered I did a little talk called Will It Ruby? Or... Well, I released a gem called Will It Ruby, which was a sort of a static type inferencing thingamajig, which kind of like pretended to run your Ruby, figure out if it would actually run. Uh, turns out I had actually had no idea what I was doing. Uh, so this kind of like led me to realize that I needed to learn a little bit more about how Ruby really works. And maybe help some others learn along the way, because uh, reading C code is, is a bit of a challenge. Uh, and uh, I'm completely insane. Right, so now we've got the why, and here's the how. Actually turned out to be really easy. Uh, it's just two lines. <laughs> okay, no, not really, not really. Uh, <laughs> it's actually really hard. Really, really hard. <laughs> Yeah, so, so how did I do it for real this time? Uh, well, I had to learn how Ruby really works. Um, there's this wonderful book by Pat Shaughnessy. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, Ruby Under a Microscope. It's a bit older. I think it's from 1.9, but like most of the way that everything works is, is pretty much still the same nowadays, and it's amazing. I would not have been able to do this without this book. Right, so it basically boils down to three main things. We've got the source code, we've got to tokenize it, compile it, execute it. We've got a nice little thingy over here, source. Your source code gets tokenized into tokens, which get parsed into an abstract syntax tree, and then an abstract syntax tree is compiled into some instructions, and then those get executed. All right, it's pretty straightforward. All right, let's have a look at what that looks like. So let's go a little function over here, chop it up into characters, turn that into tokens, and then we do some little magic over here, get some uh, pars into an abstract syntax tree, which looks kind of like this. We've got some uh, functions, some args, opcalls, local variables, all that jazz. And then, once we've got that abstract syntax tree, we take that and turn it into uh, instructions. It looks kind of like this. Right? Okay. Uh, and so now, we're going to recreate this whole process in Ruby. Um, Right, so we're going to start off with the tokenizing and parsing. So Ruby uses what's called an LALR1 parser. That stands for look ahead, left to right, rightmost derivation with one token, look ahead, parser. <laughs> it is complicated. Uh, but it's actually exposed by Ruby standard library. There's actually a couple of them. There's one called Ripper, which um, there's a module in there. You can require Ripper and you can do your own thing. And uh, recently, I think in 2.7, they added Ruby VM instruction sequence has like a function. You can give it some source code. It gives you some stuff. Um, but uh, these are actually written in C, so it kind of be not actually written in Ruby. So uh, enter Ruby parser, which again, if you were here last year, you would, uh, this would be familiar. It's a pure Ruby LALR1 parser using rack. Uh, rack is like yak, but Ruby instead of C. And yak is a derivative of bison. <laughs> All right, so uh, what Ruby parser does is it takes your Ruby and turns it into S expressions. It kind of looks like this. We get some tokens, and then, yeah, it looks like that. It kind of looks a bit lispy, but it's essentially the same kind of thing. It's an abstract syntax tree, but different. All right, so cool. We got tokenizing and parsing done. Nice. Let's go on to the compiling. All right. So Ruby gets compiled into instruction sequences, also known as ISEC. Um, uh, so we got to recursively process the S expressions. So we get our S expressions, and we turn that all into instruction sequences like that. All right, compiling, done. 
All right, let's move on to executing it. All right, all right looking good so far. All right, so Ruby uh, runs all its code in uh, its own little virtual machine. It's called YARV, which stands for yet another Ruby virtual machine. I didn't know there were others. <laughs> anyway, it's been in uh, MRI since like 1.9. Cool, so the way it works, it uses these things called control frames or CFP. The P stands for pointer because it's in C. Um, so, right, let's have a look at this little piece of code over here. We've got sort of like a control frame chain. Main calls foo, and then foo calls integer times, and then integer time calls a block in foo, and then that calls puts. And like each time it does that, it creates a new control frame. All right, so every control frame has a program counter. Uh, let's have a look at this rubbish example. Uh, this is kind of like what the instruction sequence would look like. I'm paraphrasing a bit here. Here are our instruction numbers. Let's make it look nice. All right, so here's our program counter. It starts at zero, and then as we go, puts a string, sends it, and the output starts eventually outputting stuff. Cool, all right, but like, where's all that stuff coming from? That's where we enter the stack. Uh, and it, the control frame has a stack pointer, also known as the SP. Uh, the C guys like their tiny variable names. Everything is like SP, PC, all that. All right, so let's have a look at this wonderful function. Um, all right, put it over there, get our little instruction sequences, make it look nice. All right, so here's a program counter starting at zero. And the stack, as we go along, oh, and there's the stack pointer. Uh, the put will put something onto the stack, so it always starts off with like a put self, because you know, you'll see later. Um, so now we've got main, this is the top level, so main's on the stack, and then we put two, and then we put seven, and then we put three, and then we want to add two numbers, so we gotta, watch closely, pop off the top two things off of the stack, and what's seven plus three, that's 10. And then we're going to put four. We're gonna, I'm going to speed it up here. Let's just pop that off. That's 40, 42. And then puts. And then we get 42. Everyone following? Yeah. All right, cool, cool. All right, so I've got kind of like how code runs. Let's actually talk about the actual objects, uh, how, how objects look like in Ruby. Um, everything kind of starts off with this R basic structure, um, which has, it references the class that an object is an instance of and some flags just to tell the VM like what's, what's going on. Um, most of like the primitives are sort of kind of inherited from this thing. And, uh, and then from there there's the R object and this is where like our real objects come along because that's where your instance variables are stored. And uh, everything else kind of stems from that, strings, arrays, hashes, etc. And classes. And classes are cool, they've got a super class, and all the constants and methods are stored in that guy. Right? Cool, all right, and just a note, don't get confused between R basic, R object versus basic object and object. They're not really related. This is more like primitives and then actual objects. Anyway, okay, uh, let's actually look at classes. We've got the R class structure, which is kind of weird because modules are classes, but then in Ruby, classes are modules. That's weird. All right, okay, let's have a look at this. Here's a nice little class. It's got a constant and a method, so let's have a look at what that looks like. We've got A is an R class. It's super is object, and it has uh, the class flag to say this is a class as opposed to a module. Uh, it's got a foo method, which is an isec method because it was uh, compiled Ruby into isec. And, oh, shucks, everything's fallen out of this. Uh, and a constant x, its value is 1, right? Cool. Now, superclasses. There's a basic little example over here. We got A, its super is object. We got B, and its super is A. It's pretty straightforward. All right. Now we get to including modules. All right, so another set of basic example. We have foo. We got M. Is a, so it is an R class, but its superclass is nil because modules don't have superclasses. And it's got a flag module. Where, um, just to distinguish that it's a module, and it's got the foo method in it. And here's A, it's a object, or a subclass of object. And now this weird, like, gets a little bit weird, because when you include a module in Ruby, it actually copies the module, sets its superclass to the superclass of the class you're including it into, and it 
sets it to an I class, which is a it stands for include class, and it references the original methods from the module, and then sets the classes superclass to actually be that I class, and then that's kind of how I, A gets the methods from from the module magically. All right, cool. Now, when you include multiple modules, it starts getting a little bit hairy. So we've got our M module and our N module, and we've got our A, and then we're going to include M, okay? So same as the last time, boom, 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 all right? And then now we're going to include the N module. So now N's got to get a copy, and then it's referencing N, and then N's got a super close to the M copy above it, and then A, kind of gets it. And then, as you can see now, like A's got all of N's methods through that reference there, and then it's still got the M's thing because it's a subclass of it. All right, all right, all right. Okay, now let's include modules in modules. <laughs> so we have module M and module N. N includes M and then A includes N. All right. Probably should have chosen better names because they all sound the same now. But, all right, so we've got an M class, we've got an N class, we've got an A class, and we're going to copy M, and there's the reference. N's going to point there. Okay, now A is going to include N, so we're going to copy N, and then we're going to reference the method, and then, oh shucks, now we've got to copy the copy of M, uh, which reference the M copy's methods, which reference the M's methods, and then N is going to point to M copy, and then A is going to point to N copy, and then uh, you can kind of see how it all fits together. All right. Okay, no, I, I think, right, right. I think we get it. Okay. All right. All right, getting eigenclasses. Okay, all right. Um, so eigenclasses happens when you define a method on an instance of an object instead of a instead of a class, because you can do that in Ruby. So all right, let's let's see what this looks like. Okay, so we got our object. It's a class. Um, it's super is basic object, and now we got foo. It's an ins it's an it's an R object, and it's an instance of object. So that yeah, okay. Now we're gonna define the foo method, the bar method on foo. So we're going to create a, a new class, which is Foo's eigenclass, and its class is the class class, and it's got a it's the singleton flag because <laughs> the names are weird. Like the eigenclasses, singleton classes, meta classes, they all kind of mean the same thing. Uh, and it's the subclass of object, and uh, it's got the bar method in it. And now we actually kind of rewrite Foo to actually be an instance of its own eigenclass. So it gets the bar method and then still inherits from object. All right, cool. Now there's the other kind of eigenclass, which is the class's eigenclass, which is called a meta class. Uh, this allows you to do class methods, but they're actually instance methods on the class's eigenclass. And uh, there's another catch. When you subclass a class that has a meta class, uh, it's got to have those, you know, kind of, it's got to inherit those things um, so that when you call b.foo, it'll, it'll call foo. So, yeah, how's it going to work? Uh, okay, right, let's see our class. Wait, here's the class class. It's a class, it's class, it's a class of class. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it's super class is module, which is also a, a class. Um, okay, uh, okay, here's A, it's, a, it's an R class. It's a class, it's, a, it's an instance of class, and it's a uh, super class is object. Uh, okay, all right, so we're going to def self.foo. There's going to be an eigenclass for the class. So we got a eigen, and uh, it's a, it's a, it's class class, <laughs> uh, and a singleton flag, and it's super class is also class, because a is an instance of class. All right, um, and then we're gonna, uh, yeah, there's the foo method on it, and now we set, uh, yeah, we set a is now an instance of its own eigen class, which inherits from class. Okay, right. <sighs> okay. Uh, and here's B. A B comes along. Uh, it's an instance of class, and it's a subclass of A. Okay, this is looking right. But now, how does B get foo? All right now, okay, B's got to have its own eigenclass. So we got B. It's a class. It's an instance of class. It's a singleton, and its superclass is A's eigenclass. So now you can kind of see. Okay, so B gets the foo class like, through that. Um, if that's complicated, there's an old saying in Ruby. Uh, oh, right, I forgot something. Uh, it's, it's super become, no, it's, it becomes an instance of its own eigenclass. That's what happened there. All right. So if this is confusing, there's an old Ruby saying. It's really easy to remember. 
the superclass of the eigenclass of a class is the eigenclass of the superclass of the class. <laughs> right. Okay, let's move on to uh, lexical scope. Uh, lexical scope is when you like nest classes inside of each other. Um, this is a, just a dumb example. Everything starts off with the root scope where the class is object and uh, next, so it's kind of, it's the next scope up is nil, so there isn't one above it. And then the next one is uh, A, class A's lexical scope, it has a reference to class A and the next points to the one above it, so next is main and then uh, it's the same. I'm also kind of putting a thing here where uh, when you nest a class inside another class, it also happens to define that as a constant in the class that you're in. So as you can see, C is inside of B, but it's also defined in, C is inside B, but it's also defined on B. All right, cool. Um, so the reason why lexical scope is important is because it's useful for constant lookup. So I'm gonna have a little bit of a more complicated example here, where I've got like the two instances of uh, as you can see, A has X, but B also has X, and C is a subclass of A, but it's inside B. So, and then we've got D, which is not inside B, but it's defined on B. And the, the real question here is like, what is X gonna be in these two situations? So let's actually break it down, and let's do it. When we do, there's the top level um, lexical scope. There's A's lexical scope, and it's next, it's pointing to the previous one. It's got the constant X. There's B, it's got its class, it's also under the top level scope and it's got a constant X and then there's C and it's inside B and it's a subclass of A and then it's also defined on B and then we've got D which is a subclass of A and it's under the main top level scope and it's defined on B. Got it? All right, okay, now let's actually run through finding X in this case. So we're down here by C. We're gonna follow the link to the next lexical scope, which is B, and then we're gonna find B's class, and then we're gonna, ah, there's X, which is that one, so it's two. All right, that doesn't seem too hard. All right, let's try B, D's X, which, all right, we're gonna start at D, and then we're gonna follow all the way up to the next scope, and we're gonna find an object doesn't have X, okay? All right, that's no, okay, it's okay, we got, another, we got another trick up our sleeve. We're gonna follow the superclass. Oh, that X was where the red circle was earlier, I don't know why it moved, but yeah, you get the idea. Uh, which is that guy over there, and so it's one. All right, so as you can see, lexical scope takes precedence over s uh, superclasses, so just bear that in mind. All right, cool. And then lastly, we have something called catch tables. Um, catch tables are the mechanism which defines raise, rescue, retry, ensure, break, next, redo, return, throw, and catch. <sighs> okay, all right, no, we, we can do this, we can do this. Let's. Really, really basic example. Begin, raise, raise foo, rescue, and just puts the exception. All right, this shouldn't be too bad. Let's compile it. Okay, don't worry about it. I'm just gonna hide some unimportant stuff here and bold some like slightly important stuff. All right, let's go through this. So we're interested in this raise. So when a raise happens, it's gonna look at the current I sequences catch table, and it's gonna look for a catch type of rescue and not just any catch type of rescue, it's gonna make sure that it is within the line numbers that the rays happened at. So cool, we got a match, then that's gonna find a, another I sequence, which is the actual rescue block, which is this bunch of code here, and it's gonna run that, and when it's done, it's gonna then carry on from the continue line, which is this guy. Sweet. Cool, so, mm, uh, oh yeah, this is the crazy thing about this, it uses something, in, in C called long jump, which, I mean, if you think nmap is gonna keep you up, up at night, this guy is like a whole other level. It's like a runtime go-to. Like literally it's just like running some C code and then it hits a long jump and it's just somewhere else. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I, I built this whole thing which like unraveled the stack and all the control frames and, and whatever. And I was like losing my mind. I was like, how am I actually going to do this? And then I realized, you know, Ruby does have a long jump. It's, it's Rays. <laughs> so I use Rays in Ruby to implement Rays in Ruby. Hey, got him. All right, so uh, I think that's about it. Yeah, we got executing, we got ticked to full our boxes, everything's great. Except we also have to implement the entire freaking Ruby standard library. <laughs> uh, no, no, we don't. We just implement enough of Ruby standard library to be demoable. It's fallen off the bottom of the slide, sorry. Anyway, cool. And that was actually the, the most frustrating part of most of this, because once you've got everything going, you're writing all the standard library and I'm like not writing the whole standard library. I'm just trying to get like just enough to kind of get going. And you know, sometimes I'm just like, yeah, I'll skip a few things. Like who needs, you know, array.compact anyways. Uh, so I spent a week banging my head against the wall because nothing was working. And I realized I'd forgotten to implement the nil class nil predicate. And Uh, I had implemented the basic object nil predicate, which returns false, and objects subclass basic object and nil class is a subclass of objects. So you can understand when this. <laughs> if you want to royally screw up any Ruby application, just redefine nil dot nil question mark to be false, nothing works. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, I did build it. So I guess I can show it to you. Introducing Garnet. I don't know if any of you are Steven Universe fans. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I, I chose the name Garnet because it's kind of like a gem that's like a ruby but not a ruby, but it is a ruby, but anyway, whatever. She's half ruby if you watch the show. Cool. Uh, let's, uh, let's show it off. This, if this goes well, it's going to be the most boring demo ever. In case you think I'm cheating and that's actually just doing eval rgf.read, uh, I do have a lot of code <laughs> that's doing all of that. <laughs> and more code that's doing all of that and just, uh, bunch more code doing all of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's pretty it's pretty crazy. Uh, like this this is the compiler. It's it's literally I don't even know where to start. Okay. Um j let's a little inside. I've got like a little dash d flag over here which will output what Garnet's actually kind of doing internally. Um Right. Here, here it is, here it is. Here's the, here's the S expression. And uh, compiles that to the I sequence. And then this is like my crazy rubbish debug kind of thing. You can kind of see it's beginning a control frame. And it's self is object because it's the top level one. It's I sequence is the main I sequence, which is this guy over here. And then it tells me the line in the VM where it is. Uh, Kind of cool is this part here. Oh, shucks. Oh, I deleted it. All right, yeah, there's like the push control frame. And yeah, so it begins, put self. And then here's the, oh, it's like I had to put like a before after because like you have, an, uh, you have an instruction that actually calls a method. So it actually begins the instruction to like call a method and then it actually goes and hoys a whole other 
control frame and starts running it and then like eventually it's going to end and trying to debug this thing I have to every single step see where the stack is so it's going to put self it's going to put that object over there on the stack and then it's going to put the hello world string and then after it's done with that the stack has object which is yeah all right and then there's a hello world string on the stack then we call send without block as opposed to send with block. Um, and there's a call info object here. It's the MID is the method ID, so that's puts, and it's got one argument, and it's a simple call as opposed to a complicated call with like keyword arguments and stuff. Um, and it's calling it for this control frame, which is the main control frame, and the stack is still the self main object and a string and then it then begins a new control frame for puts in method puts which is happening here there it's pushing a new control frame in the dispatch method which is the method which dispatches methods and where are we uh Oh, yeah. oh, so that's cool. It begins a control frame, and then inside puts, puts is actually going to say, puts needs to make it into a string before it puts it, so it's actually going to then call 2s on the string. Now, in real Ruby, they've optimized that out. Like, if it knows it's a string, it doesn't even have to call it, but I was like, nah, fuck it. <laughs> Assume nothing is a string. And then, um, yeah, it's also in dispatch. It's dispatching another method, and then it ends the control frame because it's done, and now... Oh, and there, there's, there's the actual puts somewhere nested inside all this mess. And then it ends the control frame for puts. And then it ends the send without block. So that's kind of the whole thing. This whole chunk, where are we? There, that whole chunk is puts. All right, so it ends send, and then it begins leave, which is just ending the thing, which then ends the main control frame. And uh, yeah, and then it ends, leave, and then it began a new control frame. I don't know what the heck. Oh, I think that it probably has something to do with like at the end of a Ruby program, you can have like an at exit, so it's always going to like run some of that, or I don't know, actually. I, you know, for something that I actually wrote, I have, sometimes I have no idea what this thing is doing. <laughs> yeah. All right, so by some sheer miracle, I've actually managed to stay in the time slot. So I guess we've got time for questions. No, oh, let me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, may, I might climb up Table Mountain tomorrow if I wake up. Okay. Yes, I understand you wrote this alone. Yep. How long did it take? I guess I could look at like the initial commit. When did I actually start? Uh, September. So that's September. October, November, December, January, February. yeah, five months. Has this motivated you to want to go and contribute to C Ruby source itself? So I have tried uh, to contribute to C Ruby, but uh, so it kind of was this weird thing. I added this weird method uh, that kind of helped you include modules into a instance, but using include and not extend, which was actually turned out to be just this weird random use case in this one project and nobody else wanted that feature. Uh, I initially submitted it as a PR to Rails because I was like, hey, this is like got to do with active support concerns, so let's add it to Rails. And they were like, no, nah, this has got nothing to do with Rails. You should like submit it to the, the, the Ruby um, source code. So I was like, okay, cool. And let me just go to like Ruby's GitHub. And I was like, oh no, this isn't actually uh, where we do our dev. This is just like a clone of like their Git repo. If you really want to contribute to C Ruby, you have to go to their red mine and then you have to learn Japanese and then you have to like <laughs> join the mailing list and then you have to like submit a diff in an email. And I was like, nah, nah, I don't have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, maybe I do. <laughs> yeah. Didn't Rubinius implement most of the Ruby standard library in Ruby? Sorry? Didn't Rubinius implement most of the standard library in Ruby? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think Rubinius did uh, implement most of its standard library in, in Ruby, um, but it was like a weird Ruby. Yeah, yeah. So funny thing, there's actually a, there was a talk by one of the Ruby core contributors. Um, I was like busy working on this on my slides and stuff, and I was like just like doing some random research, and I found a talk called "Writing Ruby in Ruby for Ruby 3." And I was like, oh god damn it, they've, they're already doing it. But uh, I actually watched the talk, and what was quite interesting is they they want to uh, they can't optimize the C uh, the standard library in C Ruby because it's written in C and Ruby's uh, like VM and, and compiler and stuff only knows how to optimize Ruby, so they can't actually like detect if a C function is a pure function so it can be inlined. So they're going to rewrite some of the standard library, or they're thinking about rewriting some of the standard library in Ruby so that they can actually optimize their own standard library with their own optimization tools. Uh, so I have absolutely no way of figuring that out because there's literally thousands of methods and hundreds of classes. Like there's even like an an iTunes um, API integration somewhere in there. It's it's weird, but um, yeah. Like the the weird thing about this is that I was like, oh no no, no like I just. It's, it's easy, I'm just gonna like read the C, look at all the functions, rewrite it in Ruby, and I'll just chug along, and like before I know it, I'll be done. And then every single time I added a new method, I discover a whole bunch more methods that I needed, and it just, it just kept, it's like one of those like never ending tasks, it just gets getting bigger the more I do it, yeah. So yeah, I've no, I have no idea. I mean, I've got enough to kind of, uh, I've got another like weird demo here, I don't, uh, let's see, I've got, Mspec here, which is the, no, not Mspec, spec. No, that's not how you spell spec. Uh, so spec is the sort of the, it's, this is the Ruby spec, so it's like a giant ass test suite of all of Ruby. I think the Rubinius guys actually made it at some point, and then it's just kind of been the, the thing that everybody runs, tests their Ruby implementations with. Um, so if I, Right, it's really weird. So you're gonna run, so specs you use something that looks like R spec, but it's not R spec, it's like a small R spec, so it's like a mini spec, so it's, it's called M spec. So you gotta run M spec, uh, actually, you know what, I think I've got, there we go. So I gotta run M spec, um, and tell it dash T to use Garnet as the Ruby, and I'm just gonna run the language specs, like not any of the standard library. Ooh, it's, so, it's, I mean, okay, that took 10 seconds. Uh, it ran 760 examples, and there's 327 failures and 94 errors, so it's, just the language stuff actually doesn't even work properly. Uh, it's amazing it actually runs at all. <laughs> so, one of, one of the things I tried to do was, um, I was like, hey, like, there's this really cool benchmark thing that Ruby's got called opt-carrot. I wonder how slow mine runs it. And it took 15 minutes to just boot up the emulator just to crash. <laughs> so I was like, I was really keen to like show off opt-carrot running at like 0 0.000001 frames per second, but it would take up half the talk <laughs> just, to, just to boot it up. Uh, so yeah, um, I think just to call a comparison, let's actually run this on, no, no, I don't want to run that again. Oh, jeez, okay. Um, on 2.7. Four seconds. So it's like, it seems like, oh, no, Garnet's only like twice as slow as regular Ruby, but trust me, it's, there's not a lot going on in, in this test suite. The more code you have, it's sort of like, goes up like not a, not not even exponential like factorial like it just is stupidly slow but yeah 
All right, I think we can do one more. So how much does modules are pre to create I didn't even bother with it. No. <laughs> like, you think like that whole module-like thing. When you do module prepend, it has to insert the module kind of below the class itself. So now there's this whole other like chain with like it's got an origin pointer which points back to the original class so that it knows that when you actually call, ask the class what its super class is, it knows to kind of like go backwards through the chain to actually find out where it is. It's, it's a complete mess. And like, and on that note, it's like, like I didn't even bother with, with, with prepend. I, I, nobody should even ask about refinements. <laughs> Yeah. Cool.